That is weird. <laughs> T-Series has most likely passed me, so it doesn't matter what I upload at this point, does it? I mean, I might as well get this over with. Book review! Do, 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 do. Smash like if you're excited! Yeah, let's get some hype in the chat, guys. As always, I've been reading, I've been doing my homework. Have you? I've been reading a lot of great literature. Book of Disquiet, amazing. Loved it. House of the Dead, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. Lolita, loved it. I'm not gonna kiss it though. <laughs> the Count of Monte Cristo. Whoa, for some reason I thought I would see through myself. That's the level of brain light I am. Incredible. It recommended by Slasso. I, mm, definitely a kiss from Pooch. I also read uh, these two books, which we're gonna discuss today. Oh God, can't show that. It's got titties on the front. Now let's just jump into it, shall we? I told you guys to read this book. Did you do your homework? I'm sorry I made you guys read this and then six months later, here I am, okay? But you read it. You have plenty of time to finish this. Come on. Literally, you could pause the video and finish it now. Do it. Let's review this together for the first time of book review. So, a little quickly about Kobo Abe. He is described as the Franz Kafka of Japan. Whatever that means, I'm told that he focuses on a nightmarish type of scenario, which definitely fits into this novel. I picked this book because it's very simple read, and I know that you guys are simpletons. I'm just kidding. I just wanted something that everyone can enjoy. It's also sort of deceivingly straightforward in the sense that there's a hidden meaning in there. You gotta read between the lines, boys. First of all, let's go through the synopsis. There is actually a film based on this movie, which won, it says here on the back, it won the 1973 Cannes film festival and it's an amazing film I, I definitely recommend you guys should watch it so the story starts off with a man walking on the dunes we don't really know anything about him however the book itself starts off with uh, telling us about a man who disappeared and no one saw and after seven years there was no trace of him so therefore the police declare him as dead so we follow this man who walks on the dunes we don't really know anything about him like I said Except that he likes to collect insects as a hobby. And that's why he's on these uh, faraway sand dunes to hopefully find rare species of insects. He takes a nap and uh, when he wakes up he finds out that he missed the last bus from to return him to wherever he lives. And therefore he meets up with some of the locals who offers that he can stay with them overnight. So the locals basically live in these houses that are located within the dunes. So they are deep down between these giant walls of sand, essentially. So you'd have to climb down through a rope ladder to get down to one of the houses. Now, at first, everything seems fine. He meets up with a woman who lives there and he's going to stay just overnight with her. However, we get told very quickly that uh, something is off about this whole situation. Not just from her face. God damn, that's creepy. Could I take a bath first? Yes, but you should do it after tomorrow. Next day, he finds out that the ladder is gone, so he can't leave the place. He tries to climb by it, but it's basically impossible since the sand is so coarse. And it just gets everywhere. So to prevent the house from getting crushed by the constant flow of sand, they have to shovel sand aside um, away from the house. And that's just a constant thing they have to do. And the woman therefore wants him to stay with him to help him do this uh, labor that they are obligated to do to live in this very bizarre location. So there's one way to describe this book is uh, if you don't like sand, I, I got bad news for you. <laughs> I love the I love the comments of this. I had to drink a lot of water during watching this movie. <laughs> Yet again, George Lucas steal from another film. I can't believe it. I don't like sand. George Lucas stole from us yet again so this is the basic plot he tries to do everything he can to escape from this situation he's also quite clever which is nice for a change when people are stuck in these weird situations he also even managed to escape at one point but uh he gets caught because it's just too far off this place and he gets taken back to the house again
At the end of the novel, he had even discovered a way to extort water from the sand so he could get drinking water much more easily, which is obviously a big discovery for him. But that doesn't really help him escape from the place either. And the last page basically reads, Spoilers! There was no particular need to hurry about escaping. On the two-way ticket he held in his hand now, the destination and time of departure were blanks for him to fill in as he wished. In addition, he realized that he was bursting with a desire to talk to someone about the water trend. And if he wanted to talk about it, there wouldn't be better listeners than the villagers. He would end by telling someone, if not today, then tomorrow. He might as well put off his escape until sometime after that. And he was therefore declared a missing person. So Kobo Abe himself lived very poor at some point in his life. I don't know when, but he lived with his wife and he basically sustained himself from selling vegetables and charcoal. I think he must have drawn from that personal experience into this story. Very similarly, in this novel, the main character still has the bare minimum to get by. He still gets food. He still gets cigarettes, he still occasionally gets sake, and if he saves up money, the people in the village he can trade stuff with. These all essentials is also at the cost of his freedom, of course. And by the end of the novel, we know that he has already made his choice and he chose to stay, which means he doesn't just lose his freedom, but he also essentially disappears, just like in the beginning of the novel, another, which happened to another person. Now, the sand in this novel is what prisons the main character. It's what uh, keeps him trapped in, in, and forced to do this physical labor to stay alive. And just like time, the sand is constantly flowing. It's something that he can't escape from. If he doesn't stop, it will literally crush him. I guess it begs the question, what's the difference of being trapped by time and being trapped by the sand like this character? Even if you escape, are you ever really truly free? Aren't we all trapped in one way or another? But I really think that is probably what I, I mean, I don't know. You can obviously interpret it as many ways, but it's like he discovered this trap at in the end to get water more easily. And it's a way for him to distract himself from this idea of escape. When in reality, does it even matter? Clearly, it doesn't to the, char the main character anymore. It kind of reminded me actually a little bit about Dostoevsky's House of the Dead. Because uh, Dostoevsky, the writer, he went to prison himself in Siberia. And he, I remember there was a line that I remember, it said, man's greatest ability is to be accustomed to anything. I think that was something like that. And it seemed to me like Kobabe wanted to ask the question, if you have the bare minimum to get by, would you be satisfied with it? Would that be enough for you? I would look forward to read what you guys thought about this novel. If you read it, let me know in the comments down below. I really recommend reading it, even if you heard me spoil it, because it is a really fun, nice read. I mean, come on, it even has pictures in it. What more can you ask for? Dog. Amazing. I would give this a 4 out of 5. A really nice book. Let's move on. Next book. Kierkegaard. Why has no one told me about Kierkegaard? I'm kind of annoyed. As a Scandi bro, you'd think they would teach us in school about one of the greatest philosophers. The father of existentialism, everyone. Søren Kierkegaard. Denmark! You know what? Applause for Gr Denmark. You did something, Denmark. Kierkegaard focused on the subject of what it meant to be existing, what it meant to be a human, basically. He was also a Christian, which really annoys me, which we'll get into eventually. But he's also a very interesting guy. I read up a little bit about him. He, uh, his father stood on top of a mountain and cursed God for his misfortunes. And then shortly after, he was became very successful in textile business, selling sweaters, I don't know. So Søren himself, he grew up very rich. His father was very strict on him and he noticed how intelligent Søren was at a very young age. So he instructed Søren to always become third at everything in class. He was not to stand out from any of his other students. Obviously he obeyed his dad and so he did. And I think that's a really interesting testimony to his genius, not just become first, but actually managed to come th third every time. He also dressed very strangely pompous or, or very dressed up 
for his age and a lot of people would call him baby man or something like that young old man maybe because he'd also have a back injury so he would always be hunched over a little bit and i think that's actually how uh, he passed away from very painfully poor Saren. Oh, well, so I picked up either or because that's one of his first greater works and It's genius. I absolutely loved it. I think well, maybe not everything. We'll get into that <laughs> The book starts off very confusingly as a narrator or someone explaining that they found these texts Kind of like found footage horror game. Look, I just stumbled upon these guys. It's totally real. And uh, the person who found these texts found them inside a bureau. And he, by just pure chance, he concluded that they were written by two different people, which he names A and B. And these are the two different people that Kierkegaard categorizes. A is the aesthetic and B is the ethic. So he does this very cleverly as a way to kind of distance himself from what his own ideas actually are. But knowing Kierkegaard's life and, and learning about it, it's pretty obvious that uh, he's gone through both of these stages. So you're supposed to be able to read it in whatever order you want. So you can read, you can read B first and you can read A after, but I would definitely read it A and B, I think at least. It doesn't matter. I tried reading this in Danish first, but it was just too hard. I'm, I couldn't do it. I think that I'll lose more on trying to understand Danish than just what is lost on the translation. But I was actually excited about reading, potentially. Maybe it was Norwegian I could do it. So, it starts off with A, which is the aesthetic point of view. And boy, oh boy, it started off so interesting with the really thoughtful existential ideas. And then out of nowhere, he just hits you with 200 pages of the Don Giovanni opera. That's right, everyone. 200 dense pages describing why the Don Giovanni opera is the greatest thing ever. I'm convinced that no one has actually read this book. Because <laughs> goddamn, that was tough to get through. I am really glad I did, though. I think, obviously, reading this kind of philosophy, a lot of it is lost on me. It's not like I take notes or anything while I read it. I wish I did, though. I am actually happy, though, how much more susceptible I am to this kind of literature as opposed to last year when I tried to read Nietzsche and it was just, it felt like one big blur. So, the aesthetic. Get on with it, Felix. The aesthetic focuses on your own pleasures and experiences. And as an aesthetic, you seek to maximize these experiences and pleasures. That is the goal of the aesthetic. It's very egotistic almost, you could say. So to summarize these 200 pages, uh, the opera makes me feel good, basically. Now, learning about character God, he himself lived as an aesthetic in his younger years. When his father passed away, I think he probably felt very liberated in a sense, just from hearing how strict his dad was uh, towards Saren. He obviously inherited his money as well, so he got financial freedom as well. To really just live this aesthetic lifestyle, he would get drunk very often, and these sort of thing. Now, being aesthetic or living the aesthetic lifestyle obviously has its advantages. It distracts us from any anxiety, it distracts us from boredom, and Kierkegaard put great emphasis on boredom. It's not just that you're bored. If you are bored, then you're not stimulated properly, which means you're psychologically not healthy. So the aesthetic life point is just a way to escape this boredom. And however, Kierkegaard points out that eventually, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing aesthetic correct, by the way, but the, the inevitable problem with it is that due to repetition, we will eventually, inevitably get bored. Whatever temporary relief we have, from watching another PewDiePie video will eventually fade due to repetition. I know it sucks, okay? But that's the truth. Only when experiencing something for the first time is when we truly appreciate something. And, or not only, but mostly. And also based on how we think how often we can experience something. Maybe if you go on a trip, you will appreciate that trip more. If you know you, you can only get go there once the transformation or the move from the aesthetic point of view to the ethic point of view which is something Kierkegaard went through himself which had a big impact on not just his life but his philosophy was when Kierkegaard was going to marry Regina Olsen so he was engaged to Regina Olsen but he decided to call after the wedding because he wanted to focus on his philosophy 
for him to break up this engagement had a, a huge took a huge toll on Kierkegaard because socially he got rejected obviously a lot of people were angry at him for making this decision and uh, I can just imagine what that would mean to to go through with a choice like that not just losing your life but also these other consequences that follows it but I can imagine that in his mind his love for Regina would be kept the strongest by also calling off the wedding he writes here uh, the famous line in the book is uh, either or an aesthetic lecture if you marry you will regret it if you do not marry you will also regret it if you marry or if you do not marry you will regret both whether you marry or you do not marry you will regret both whether you laugh at the world's follies or you weep over them, you will regret both. Believe a girl, you will regret it. If you do not believe her, you will re also regret it. If you believe a girl or you do not believe her, you will regret both. Whether you believe a girl or you do not believe her, you will regret both. If you hang yourself, you will regret it. If you do not hang yourself, you will regret it. If you hang yourself or you do not hang yourself, you will regret both. Whether you hang yourself or you do not hang yourself, you will regret both. This gentleman is the sum of all practical wisdom. <laughs> okay. Now, this is obviously a very famous line. To be fair, don't read this expecting that it's just going to be like that. Nevertheless, Kierkegaard's transformation into the ethic point of view, I think at least, I don't know. The ethic point of view is for living for the greater good, for the greater good of society and living beyond your own needs. He also points out through the character B, that choices in his life have led him through different paths some that were obviously very hard for him Kierkegaard himself made many choices in his life that are kind of questionable but he acknowledged that it was his choices nonetheless and he emphasized that on the ethical point of view and that you must take responsibility for your choices which he definitely did. He, I, he, I think he also, I don't remember exactly, but he had some quarrel with the church just because of another really strange decision. Sorry, I know that's vague, I just don't remember. Kierkegaard then brings up the problem with the ethical point of view, which is despair, which he defines as the tension between the finite and the infinite. As a human, you're scared of, of uh, dying, but you are also probably don't want to live forever either. He says that we can never really escape this anxiety or boredom or despair unless... That's right. Thank you, Kierkegaard. There is a solution to your problem that you brought up with ex existentialism. Thank you so much, Kierkegaard. I appreciate it. What is it? Oh, you must take a leap of faith in God. Thanks, Kierkegaard. Very cool. That's right, everybody. All you have to do is believe in God no matter what. Kierkegaard says that God is always right no matter what, and you should take a leap of faith in believing in him, even if there is not a single evidence for it. And that's how we adopt the religious stage of life, and we escape the boredom, we escape the anxiety, and we escape the despair. I did a big mistake, I think, of reading these two at the same time, don't do that. Just don't do that. Very bad idea. I genuinely felt terrible while reading both of these. I didn't think what I read would affect me so much, but it did, and I would not recommend it. I'm glad I read them, however, but I'm also glad it's over. That's it for book review. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, smash like, subscribe. We can bring back and stop T-Series again. Let's do it. I'm gonna post what the next book review is on the subreddit, book clap, review clap. So if you're interested in following me on the next book review in the book club, check out the link in the description. I think you guys can really enjoy reading. It's definitely uh, made my life something. And that's it, bye. What? Tuber simulator is becoming relevant! No! No, don't leave! No, please! Sponsor Eagle, please do something! Yes! Yes! <laughs> ah, this game is still relevant, goddammit.